Today I'll be talking about uh, the COVID uh, infections that we all are seeing, but I am talking in uh, perspective of the neonatologist. As because of the lockdown, we all were locked in this summer in Sangli. So I had my summer adventures with perinatal COVID, and I'll be sharing them with you. So. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic is the new chapter of uh, human civilization. Now we all are uh, aware that this pandemic has posed lots of new challenges and pre has presented with the different things. Being a new disease, we are still in the phase of understanding it, and there are dynamic knowledge trends that uh, are changing and changing our understanding about the disease and uh, the way it is managed. Neonatology is probably the last specialty who is facing the COVID perinatal uh, COVID uh, infections, and now we are in the COVID perinatal syndromes. As we all know, summer starts in March. Uh, this was the first thing that happened to us. A two and a half months old male uh, baby was referred with fever and rash. Mother had similar complaints eight days back. Baby had a high fever and erythematous rash. On the admission, baby had a convulsion and uh, baby was needing uh, nasal oxygen. We did the whole workup. Uh, his CSF was normal, and both the mother and baby turned out to be uh, COVID IgG positive but IgM negative. The markers were sent, and these were the investigations. On admission, baby had thrombocytopenia. His CRP was high. Ferritin was high. D dimer was five times, and uh, his LDH was high. So, what is this? So, this is MISC that we all know. MISC is now in the headlines. Now, what is MISC? The WHO criteria for MISC says it is the disease of children and adolescents who are below nineteen years of age and who have fever for three days or more. And it should have two of the following: so rash. So it is like basically it's like a Kawasaki syndrome that happens in pediatric. So rash or bil uh, or bilateral non-prolonged conjunctivitis or mucocutaneous inflammation, hypotension or shock, myocardial dysfunction, pericarditis, valvulitis, or ab abnormal coronary uh, dilatation, evidence of coagulopathy. Acute gastrointestinal problems like diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, and elevated markers of inflammation, and no other microbial cause of inflammation, and evidence of COVID-19. So it may be the active infection or it may be the immunoglobulins uh, antibodies. Now, is this the only definition? No. There are three different uh, definitions or diagnostic criteria. The differences are in the age also. And there are certain differences like how they are defining fever, how long should the fever and all those things. But basically everything is similar.
Now what happened to our patient? We administered IVIG as it was uh, advised. Because of his uh, high D dimers, we uh, put him on low molecular weight heparin. This baby took long time to uh, for thrombocytopenia to respond, and so we have to give after around uh, five to six days. We repeated the second dose of immunoglobulin, and then the thrombocytopenia responded. The baby was otherwise clinically stable, feeding well, but the thrombocytopenia persisted. His platelet counts were throughout sixty to sixty-five thousand, but after second dose of IVIG, he responded well. Baby was discharged, but his Uh, D dimer was still high, so we uh, continued his low molecular weight heparin with the pediatrician. And around after two weeks, uh, the D dimer normalized, and then we stopped his low molecular weight heparin. Now, this was in the March end, and then it took around two months. We did not bother about COVID, and then the second case came. It was a four-day-old male referred for respiratory distress. He was admitted uh, with a pediatrician for four days on ventilator for severe meconium aspiration syndrome. The baby, uh, when the pediatrician uh, received the baby in the NICU, his saturation was somewhere in 60s, so he was intubated and ventilated, continued ventilation for four days, but he was not responding well. So he was referred. On admission, ventilation was continued. Sepsis screen was positive. Already on meropenem, so we continued same. high ventilation needs and the x-ray showed poor expansion of the lungs so surfactant was administered ventilation was weaned a bit but we could not wean him completely we tried extubation and the extubation failed now uh, we had uh, we did eco because to rule out pulmonary persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn because it's a meconium aspiration syndrome the oxygen need was remaining 60% and above but that was normal the blood culture was uh, no growth we had sent the tracheal aspirates and it grew pseudomonas so it's okay pseudomonas we kept on treating him but this patient needed ventilation for 13 days with me and 4 days 4 to 5 days before so it was almost 18 days at the similar time we got this second patient it was somewhere around 4 uh, 5 days after the first patient This was a 12 hours old male baby, late preterm, 34 weeks, 2 kilo, referred for severe respiratory distress syndrome. Was on oxygen with the pediatrician, but the distress increased. Baby started desaturating. On admission, the baby we tried as usual. We gave a CPAP trial, but he failed. So we put to him, uh, put him to ventilator. X-ray chest was reticular granular pattern, RDS stage three. So surfactant was administered. Ventilation uh, weaned. By the end of day two, the ventilator requirement started increasing. So we repeated the X-ray. There were few crepts, so X-ray was repeated, and upcoming consolidation was seen on both sides, more on the left side. So we adjusted the ventilation, graded up his antibiotics to piperacil and tazobactam. Respiratory therapy was started, and third day, around twelve thirty, this baby collapsed on ventilator. Suddenly, saturation went to twenty thirty. Baby had gasping like breathing, so we did the dope, and baby had pneumothorax. So ICD was inserted. Then the baby settled in half an hour. His blood culture was negative. His tracheal aspirates were negative. He was having consolidation, so we sent the tracheal aspirates. The baby needed ten days of ventilation. Now the issue was there were two babies in the NICU. on ventilator not responding as we expect nothing great in the reports that should be absolutely unusual the management was as per reports for the baby with pseudomonas he was on the antibiotics which he was sensitive to this other baby was also on the highest antibiotics so i talked to the pediatrician and obstetrician if i am missing something in the history both the mothers they had done the uh, uh, as routinely nowadays they are doing any mother who is getting admitted in obstetric hospital they are doing the rt pcr that was negative baby my mothers had no symptoms then i thought that i should send the covid antibodies this was the first time i sent the covid antibodies on the same day both the babies both the babies turned out to be igg positive but igm negative now the first baby 
was 16 days old and the second baby was uh, around 6 days old when these antibodies were sent both the mothers were with us so we sent the mothers uh, igg and uh, igg was uh, positive and igm was negative now on the 16th day when these reports came positive we sent the inflammatory markers the platelet count for first baby was 17 uh, 170000 crp was 48 ferritin was 310 D dimer was 1.8 and LDH was 744. The second baby who was still in the first week of life, the platelet count was 66,000. CRP was 57.8. Ferritin was 1,000. D dimer was 4.1 and LDH was 1539. Now our the our cutoff of D dimer was less than 0.5. So this should be read in the those terms. So is it neonatal infection? now iggs can be transferred across the placenta passively from mother to baby at the end of the second trimester till the birth till is born igms are produced by the fetus if there is transplacental infection vertical transmission is still not reported though placental infection and inflammation is reported now both these babies had igg positive so it was probably the maternal immune response and not the fetal infection so it was the maternal igg which had entered the fetal circulation and reached the neonate mothers were asymptomatic when they infected because they did not give any history of uh, suggestive of covid so this might be a fetal inflammatory syndrome firs now this can happen to any infective or non infective agent when it induces severe placental inflammation so it can happen with something like e coli it can happen with severe um uh, amnionite chorioamnionitis it can happen with uh, sometimes any non infective severe uh, uh, episode that happens in utero so it might be miscn that is misc neonate or it may be fetal infant response syndrome now we come back to our cases we administered ivig the platelet counts increased in both patients crp fell down ferritin came down d dimer came down ldh came down uh, in these uh, patients we did not give any low molecular weight heparin because uh, they are neonates and neonates the the uh, the thrombotic system is very sensitive so we should not be uh, hurry, we should not be hurrying for any intervention so both the babies were extubated in next 2 to 3 days nasal oxygen was needed for quite some time kangaroo mother care and feed oral feeding was started once the babies were settled discharge home on breast feeding and what is spoon feeding on follow both of them had one baby had two follows other baby has one had one follow both of them were are well on follow now fourth case this is end of june so we have seen march and may and now this was june end now this is what usually happens peer pressure when we are in uh, we are in some between something then the things start heating up so this was a two days old uh, male baby meconium aspiration syndrome he was referred for increasing respiratory distress on day 2 he was put to ventilator after he failed a cpap trial this day but he stabilized on ventilator hemodynamics was stable x ray chest was improving ventilation could not be wind as expected so i was expecting that i could extubate him in next uh, first uh, one or two days but i could not do it we did the echo to rule out pulmonary persistent pulmonary hypertension that was not normal the blood culture had no growth now we always have the wisdom from the past we just discharged two patients who were in that covid phase so a patient came from the similar zone of covid so covid antibodies were sent igg of baby came positive igm became negative mother had same thing mother did not have any symptoms throughout her pregnancy to tell us and her sars covid rt pcr was done at the admission at obstetric hospital that was also negative now what happened now this patient was pretty stable so this was just the what we call six sense or sometimes we just don't want to lose it inflammatory markers were slightly abnormal but not very disturbing baby remained stable after this report came in matter of one day the baby was extubated so we did not do anything we did not give any ivig we did not give any steroid throughout we have not given steroid to any of our patients from the beginning low molecular weight heparin was not needed baby was extubated on day 5 discharged on day 16 breastfeeding 
Now this is the case. It came uh, immediately after the second and third case. when we had just diagnosed and treated and got extubated those patients where uh, we had fetal inflammatory response syndrome this patient came within a week of that on 4th of june this was a two days old female baby she was not feeding well and had a jaundice so she was referred for clinical sepsis she had lost weight and she had hyperbilirubinemia baby had ictus and positive sepsis screen so antibiotics started nerve culture sent but she was stable hemodynamically mother had covid one month before the delivery it was a mild disease so the relatives were very anxious baby was stable but relatives were anxious this can be this is appropriate see uh, with uh, with mic we also can't take chance something who looks fine at this moment may worsen in uh, near future so we sent the antibodies the covid antibody igg was positive igm was negative in the baby so this was obviously the maternal response but this markers were mild abnormal this uh, ld is uh, dimer was some 1.2 or something so we did not change any management on day 3 the baby was shifted to mother uh, in the room breastfeeding continued and on day 6 the baby was discharged now this is something that happened in between now in we are feeling the heat of covid in Uh, by may end in june so june was for like covid heat for us and this patient came on 16th of june at 6 hours this baby was sent severe meconium aspiration he was in shock he was referred for progressive respiratory distress he reached us on severe respiratory distress shock hypoglycemia convulsion almost close to arrest revived intubated ventilated on admission inotrope started fluid resuscitation uh, uh, done and then we this patient got admitted in 3 hours we got his echo done because he was in very bad position he, on ventilation he was needing very high ventilation so we wanted to know about pphn and this echo showed dilated coronaries which is suggestive of mic now this was the first patient where we had in neonate cardiac findings in pediatrics we are getting for last one year and it was very common almost 50 to 60% of pediatric patients of mic had cardiac involvement but this was the first neonate in our unit where we got dilated coronaries so it was in the evening thursday so we talked to father father said sir whatever it is do it ivig was administered it was brought and administered by midnight he was a uh, Uh, of ivig was received ivig blood samples were collected and sent inotropes adjusted umbilical length test because he was in shock his initial hypoglycemia stabilized his initial hypocalcemia and hypomagnesia uh, started correcting now these were the markers so this was 49000 platelet count crp of 69.7 ferritin of 155.9 and dimer of 3.2 this was before ivig we gave ivig then platelet counts increased to 3.5 lakh so crp halt d dimer came down now this is the good news second day next day morning we got the covid antibody report of bb and when we decided that these findings came we informed the uh, obstetrician and the sample of mother was also taken and it was done and both of them came negative Came negative for IV, IgG and IgM. Mother's RT PCR was negative, and this was just a baby who had come reached us within a matter of six hours. So there was no possibility of baby getting infected. Baby had persistent hypoglycemia after day three, and uh, we sent his stress sample. His G, uh, glucose infusion rate had reached somewhere eighteen. his reports came back he had hyperinsulinemia so we started diazoxide and hydrochlorothiazide hypoglycemia got corrected baby had multiple convulsions even when the sugars were normal his calcium was uh, corrected his magnesium was corrected but still he was convulsing so we did eeg eeg was grossly abnormal so mri was done and mri showed a uh, small hemorrhages deep to deeper to choroid plexus so there were deeper small uh, hemorrhages which were probably causing the convulsions now his uh, his thrombotic profile was abnormal he was having embolic uh, septic embolic phenomena on the finger there were small ulcers 
blood culture was uh, he sent twice on admission once and then, then repeated both of the times it was negative eco was repeated after one week had dilated coronaries so we told father that if it doesn't settle down then we might repeat his ivig but then the eco was again repeated after one week the eco was normal the coronaries had turned to normal so what is this so the message is very simple not every inflammation is covid we we used to get this thing also in past also before covid when we used to get very bad choreomyelitis patients or uh, patients with very uh, fulminant uh, like gram negative sepsis or even a bad perinatal incidence like a severe uh, hypoxia so these things do happen but in the heat of covid we focus on covid so inflammatory markers and eco findings may look like MIS, baby showed response to IVIG, so probably it was a severe perinatal disease. So it was fetal inflammatory response syndrome, not always related to COVID. So what are the lessons from this summer of twenty one? Pregnant women can have asymptomatic cold infections, and as we are saying that most of the patients are asymptomatic. More than fifty percent are asymptomatic. This applies to pregnancy also. Sick neonate not responding well may have inflammatory syndrome. It may be what we can call it MIC or neonate, or we can call it fetal inflammatory response syndrome. Not all newborns who uh, newborns who suffer. Uh, not all newborns of mothers who had covid in pregnancy suffer they might remain stable like the adults not all patients of mis where you get uh, inflammatory response and documentation of the uh, abnormal parameters need treatment so ivig and steroid are not needed in every patient rather if you see we have not used steroid uh, uh, even a single time IVIG was needed in uh, this uh, three patients out of six, out of which one patient was not COVID. Sometimes equine inflammatory markers may mislead you. You just get carried away because of the heat of the COVID. And most important thing is we should be ready for surprises. This is a new disease. It's still evolving. We really don't know how it works. And in, when it comes to uh, developing systems like neonates. we still really don't know what happens so in nature we get all these things this is a blue oak leaf butterfly which i had clicked in belvai butterfly park last year so when it closes the the thing you can see it is like a dry leaf and when it opens you see that it's a butterfly and the most important thing be watchful we are still in the evolving disease we might take 2 3 years to understand this disease so better be watchful and continue our care thank you <clears throat> i will start uh, so this these are two cases i am presenting two cases of abdominal pregnancy which is a quite rare occurrence uh, first case i did uh, with dr gazi madam and second uh, with uh, uh, dr shilpa and i was really involved in these cases these cases were diagnosed by dr anil joshi and dr bharat mudalgi uh, so uh, they also have credits in this Uh, the first case is a 20 year old uh, primary lady uh, she came with history of tv spotting with back pain in abdomen for around 3 months um, she presented with acute pain uh, since 2 days and shock uh, when her sonography was done uh, it showed around 16 week live extra uterine pregnancy with possible adhesions to omentum and bowel and there was a gross hemoperitoneum so we explored the patient on exploration uh, there was a extra uterine pregnancy which was adherent to the broad ligament and uh, there was well formed placenta in the sac uh, it had ruptured in the peritoneum so we had around 2 liters of hemoperitoneum um, what we did was the excision of the sac uh, you can see the fetus as well as uh, the sac in this and uh, uh, this uh, pet, uh, this kidney tray uh, shows the fetus the cord and uh, the placenta <clears throat> this was a short video uh, we took intraoperatively uh, which shows the fetus actually this was in the sac uh, but while handling uh, the sac ruptured uh, but prior to the surgery uh, it had already caused hemoperitoneum so we excised the sac we drained uh, the hemoperitoneum 
and uh, we put a peritoneal drain and closed this was the omentum which was adherent uh, to the part of sac and uh, the bowel bowel was free uh, the second case is a 38 year old lady uh, she was para to life too uh, she had previous to lscs and her tubal ligation was also done uh, there was history of amenorrhea but uh, because tubal ligation was done pregnancy was missed she presented with pain in abdomen and on ultrasound she uh, showed a uh, extra uterine live pregnancy without any uh, uterine abnormalities there was no hemoperitoneum uh, so the diagnostic laparoscopy was done uh, this case this table we decided to go ahead with laparoscopy uh, there was unruptured sac adherent to a right ovary and the omentum there was mild hemoperitoneum the sac was dissected and excised these are the pictures on the ultrasound uh, which shows uh, fetus and fetal heart was also seen all the uhg parameters were corresponding to 12 weeks of pregnancy the first case was around 16 weeks of pregnancy <clears throat> so this was the picture on laparoscopy there was a big sac which was uh, overhanging the uterus uterus was behind this there was some hemoperitoneum omental adhesions and adhesion to the right ovary so this is a specimen uh, after excision uh, we took a small incision in the left flank uh, to remove uh, the specimen this is a placenta the cord and the fetus so uh, abdominal pregnancy is a type of ectopic pregnancy normally you know ectopics occur in the fallopian tubes uh, rarely uh, in the ovary but uh, very very rarely it can happen primarily in the abdomen which we refer as abdominal pregnancy so by definition it is a pregnancy which occurs in the peritoneal cavity exclusive of tubal ovarian or intra ligamentary locations it can be primarily located in the peritoneal cavity or secondary to a rupture of ectopic pregnancy or a tubal abortion so uh, it develops in the tube but the tube ruptures and uh, the embryo gets out into the peritoneum or there is just the spontaneous tubal abortion now these are the criteria for primary abdominal pregnancy uh, the tubes and ovary should be normal there should be no evidence of utero peritoneal fistula pregnancy related solely to the peritoneal surfaces and there is no evidence of secondary implantation following initial primary tubal nidation that means primarily it has developed into tube and it has come out so that should not be there so in our cases we uh, have had seen all these criteria fulfilled so as i already told you uh, there are two types one is a primary where embryo implants in the peritoneal cavity itself now there are uh, very interesting theories about this what they say is if the uh, ovulation occurs near the menses then the flow is in the opposite direction the flow is from the uterus to the peritoneal cavity into the tube so the implantation occurs in the peritoneal cavity the other theory is that uh, there is a natural flow of peritoneal fluid into the pelvis uh, due to the dependent drainage along with that the embryo gets shifted into the peritoneal cavity and into the pouch of douglas and gets implanted or the secondary as i told you like a rupture of uh, tubal pregnancy or tubal abortion now abdominal pregnancies form only 1.5% of all ectopics and it can be seen in around 1 in 10000 to 30000 normal pregnancies now it is more seen uh, commonly in the third world countries like us where socio economic status is low hygiene is poor so the chances of pelvic inflammatory diseases are more history of infertility tubal sterilizations tubal reconstruction surgeries and pregnancy with iucd are uh, the other things which can lead to the abnormal pregnancies uh, now the symptoms symptoms can be abdominal pain vaginal bleeding and amenorrhea this is a classical triad of ectopic what we call and it it can also be diagnosed as a surprise during diagnostic laparoscopy or a laparotomy now what are the investigation to diagnose pregnancy in a case of amenorrhea like uh, urinary pregnancy test or beta hcg um, ultrasonography can uh, conclusively diagnose an abdominal pregnancy if in doubt then transvaginal or an mri can help in the diagnosis in the treatment treatment will be excision of uh, the sac by laparotomy or laparoscopy and rarely the pregnancy can reach the age of survival this has also been documented in the case reports Uh, medical management can also be done like uh, you know methotrexate is used but uh, this is not a very successful way of managing the abdominal pregnancies
so when i reviewed the literature um, there are many case reports about these pregnancies but i found a couple of interesting review articles so i will just go through it the first is a systematic uh, review where they studied 225 cases of primary abdominal pregnancies which are in the early age now again these abdominal pregnancies are in two uh, age, uh, two groups like uh, early and late so uh, 20 weeks is a cut off so this is a early uh, age, uh, early abdominal pregnancy uh, the most common site as you can see is uh, pouches like pouch of douglas or uterovesical pouch in the adnexa or at the multiple other locations so what was the conclusion of the paper the conclusion was that it's a very rare but dangerous complication uh, medical therapy is an option but it is rarely successful you may have to go for surgery again and uh, the mortality from these abdominal ectopics is higher than the other ectopic pregnancies so the possibility of uh, such cases should always be kept in mind by a clinician now this is a very interesting case report where they have studied 163 cases of late or advanced abdominal pregnancy beyond 20 weeks of gestation since 1946 this was a paper from africa but they have studied all the cases throughout the world and most of the cases were seen in third world countries uh, what they have found is fetal deaths around 72% but uh, the thing to remember is around 28% of babies they could salvage maternal deaths were death rate was around 12% and complication rate was around 55% so very high rate of death and complication in these abdominal pregnancies the conclusion was more than 90% of the cases were before 1990 when ultrasound was a rarity so the diagnosis was not done and uh, those cases uh, uh, which were seen recently are seen more in the third world countries because in developed countries obviously whatever abdominal pregnancies were detected were managed early in the gestational life so uh, this is a disease of third world country you can say so what is the take home message abdominal pregnancy is rare but possible diagnosis you have to keep high index of suspicion medical management can be occasionally useful but remember it's a surgical thing which is a gold standard uh, laparoscopy is a good tool especially the patient if the patient is very stable as we did in the second case it was really a nice experience and patient could go home on the very second day of surgery so these are the two cases which are very interesting which i came across uh, in uh, last uh, 15 days or so and i thought sharing with you thanks again for giving me the opportunity to talk with you it's been uh, covid everywhere and a uh, lot of lot of medical practices more into uh, covid now and so a uh, few of the investigations including uh, radiological hrct has been paramount importance in uh, treatment planning triage or uh, deciding the course of disease or even the management plan so uh, everywhere the people or the clinicians uh, do speak more about uh, or even the practitioners physician to speak more about scores and more into scores so what we did was the first wave that we faced a lot of cases we had been through literature and we came across few of the findings which may be very important for management perspective so in the in the uh, by late first wave or the start of second wave we uh, starting started making it more more uh, uh, focused on that part of the uh, uh, hr city investigation so i'll just show you six cases wherein how the treatment would differ though the score is same for the same uh, for the patient so this is hr am i am i is my screen seen yes seen well seen sir okay thank you thank you so i'll just go scroll fastly through this uh, hr city chest image as you all see and everybody knows now these are the ground glass opacities scattered geographically everywhere in the both lobes of lung okay. this is the second case now we see they have become little bit dense they have started showing interstitial thickening also within these uh, densities ground glass densities third is now we see 
it is showing more pronounced interstitial thickening and few consolidative early changes. This is again more dense in the bases, more of consolidation than uh, just ground glass opacity. It's giving a little bit of crazy paving pattern, which we call on HRCT. The fifth case, these are more dense now consolidations. Uh, a confluent one, and this is something which is going atelectasis. The disease is undergoing atelectasis, like fibroid atelectasis changes. So now all these three cases, they have got almost similar scores. Almost, I would say, from ranging from 14 to somewhere 16, 17. So uh, score, I would rather say, is really helpful in. Uh, saying how much the pneumonia is involving the lung. Okay, that's fine. But it, it, it will not give you uh, what, what should be the next plan of action for the clinician. So in Atpadi, uh, I do have one of my CT units wherein we did this uh, in, the, in the second wave with my friend, Dr. Kiran Lare, uh, MD physician. Uh, with him, we, we saw that these first cases, like early case, uh, progressive case, and progressive to pick stage cases. These initial uh, two stages of the disease, they definitely require uh, aggressive management in terms of addition of antiviral remdesivir. Okay. Uh, the, once you start developing consolidations and which they have now developed atelectatic changes as in this case, the role of antiviral uh, reduces and adding uh, antiviral remdesivir may not help even though patient score is high. Therein, it is more of oxygen and steroid support or anti-inflammatory support. So, so uh, just labeling the score or just discussing the score may not help the patient. Always you will have to know what is the stage of pneumonia as we know that it starts as, uh, from the inflammation, red hepatization, gray hepatization, then fibroatelectasis is the phase of every pneumonia. In a similar way, in the COVID also, it ranges from ground glass opacities to fibroatelectasis. In, in that duration, depending upon the stage of disease, it is very important. So we always uh, like we uh, we always emphasize that what stage of disease it is. It is early to progressive. It is progressive. It is a uh, pick. So we we got to know that this has got some importance in this uh, COVID uh, disease uh, evaluation. So that was the one one takeaway point we got that okay we need uh, to be emphasizing more on. What is the stage of disease that would help the clinician? Score is important, but at the same point of time, this is also important. Some, some other findings we found were association of diseases. With COVID. Uh, I'll just fastly scroll through this scan. So here are these few ground glass opacities, few more here, few here. So definitely this is peripheral pneumonia in the patches with a low score and it is more of an early to progressive stage of the disease. So okay, but the underlying basal lung, if you see, it has got this interstitial thickening, which is not actually the part of disease. So this has to be in the report and this has to be kept in the mind by the clinician also that and the radiologist not just mentioning what the score is and even though what is the stage of disease. It is always important to mention, okay, so this patient has also got the previous disease, which is interstitial lung disease. Similar way, another case. This was kind of, the previous case was kind of indeterminate interstitial lung disease. This was kind of usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. The cysts honeycombing was seen at the basis and uh, uh, tractional bronchiectatic changes with the COVID. We see COVID also. 
in between as a peripheral pneumonic patches. So this is also important because this decides again the oxygen requirement of the patient. So that, that, that we also found out. This was the case in the first wave developed COVID. Now patient again came with cough, some amount of fever, and that was since two to three days. Uh, no symptoms prior to that. So if, if, if we scroll through this scan, so we see there are some peripheral irregular interstitial thickening areas with some, some organizing consolidations, some more here. And, and reticulations. Again, this, this is ILD with COVID, which is in the subacute phase actually. And, and this was basically a post-COVID sequelae. Post-COVID pneumonia uh, can turn into fibrosing pneumonitis, which can be non-specific interstitial pneumonia or usual interstitial pneumonia. Again, emphysematous lung disease is important. I don't have a piece of that from right now. But emphysematous lung disease, the extent of emphysematous lung disease is also important to be mentioned in the report, which will help the clinician and what we found also. This was again a case with RT-PCR positive. Again, COVID pneumonia changes in both lungs. Few nodules in the right lung. If you could see, I don't know if everybody is able to see few nodules. These are cavities, thick walled cavities. These, these are the few nodules. So, so this is reactivation of tuberculosis with COVID. So that is another thing. So we should not be counting this into the score. That is one point. Second point, always, always try to see super added secondary infection, reactivation of any previous disease and has to be there in the impression of the report. I usually see reports mentioning scores and COVID positive, scores, COVID positive, scores, COVID positive. That's all. So that, that is again very important. This is very interesting too. In our region, we have seen few cases uh, similar to that. This was post-COVID, started again developing fever, breathlessness, and episode of tumor crisis. These are all like uh, spaceships roaming in the sky or some drones roaming in the sky. So all these are cystic changes, peripheral consolidative rim, ground glass opacity. Again, few clusters of nodules in the subsegmental region, adjacent to these species. And this underlying underlying lung was actually post-COVID phenomenon in the primary uh, previous disease and some other fibro fibrotic changes. So again, these are not pneumatoceles within COVID. These, these are basically fungal infections and angio-invasive fungal infections. These are typical for angio-invasive involvement and one of the most common cause for these typical appearances as per the patient responded very well and is very fine post antifungal treatment in this case. So secondary infections should always be there in the report. If you find any suspicion of finding that you feel that this is uh, something other than COVID, it should be there because it is so much of COVID now in the radiology that any any chest gun, our eyes go for more of consolidation, ground glass opacity, and peripheral pneumonia than anything else right now. Any any marker that you would tell clinician, okay, this is something that if the patient has got is a bit risky. This young chap, 32 year post COVID has got these peripheral peripherally placed few are the infosomatous changes few are actually bullae and few are nematoceles if you can see this air fluid level containing nematoceles some more here cystic spaces more here so covid has got tendency we saw one case with covid followed by fungal aspergillus cavitations or cystic disease formation this is 
primarily covid induced cystic changes in the lung as nematocele this is something a bit uh, you have to tell clinician that okay this guy can have something like this suddenly so the one of the which was laterally placed here ruptured and got into pneumothorax then this fellow was inserted with icd and then was doing well still there were few nematocels frankly speaking i had discussed with the clinician okay there are few other on the right side you should or the patient should take care of unfortunately that one also a uh, blow and again the pneumothorax on the right side this was the previous one which was loculated then with the tube in so something like any any associated complication or any point that that may help clinician okay this patient needs some care or some something that might happen suddenly the patient should be educated for the last one cough fever breathlessness uh, 60 year male oh i lot of covid right a lot of ground glass opacities lot of reticulations some interstitial thickening some fibroidal ectatic changes in the base okay let's score it and let's give it up so many covid cases are piled up okay okay fast fast okay let, let me tell you this is not covid so frankly speaking it is central disease it is not at all peripheral disease you see the periphery is spread see the bases bases are spread it is upper lung involvement central disease central ground glass opacity we asked a uh, clinician okay let us know what was the status let's check what the patient has got and i had reported as pneumocystis carina pneumonia could be one of the possibilities and the patient turned out to be immunocompromised after testing and they responded well so last take away is not everything that looks ground glass with some reticulations with some atelectatic changes uh, should be covid in this covid scenario you should think out of the box and you should always see clinical details if available at this case we did not but this turned out to be and patient responded well went home well without any issues no covid that that's all from my side sir so uh, we all know that the most popular uh, covid uh, uh, manifestation is mucor but uh, other than mucor we also uh, want to uh, i want to tell about the retinal manifestations which are equally important uh, in this era so as we all know that uh, li wingling is uh, uh, was the ophthalmologist who brought into notice of uh, people and uh, throughout the world about uh, this covid virus so i'll not go in the detail pathophysiology of this but uh, it's a direct viral invasion into the alveolar and epithelial cells and endothelium and uh, because of the inflammatory response uh, due to the uh, release of cytokines settling up can lead to inflammatory as well as thrombotic changes and all other d dimer and all other parameters are raised so this is a diagram uh, i want to tell about in detail uh, so because of the direct invasion uh, we uh, we see a thrombotic uh, microangiopathy which can lead to retinal ischemia and which leads finally to the vascular retinopathies and when there are uh, direct invasion and inflammatory response and because of the delayed immune mediated response we see vasculitic changes and retinitis changes so this is a case of a 55 year old gentleman came with a history of painless diminution of vision in left eye since two days he was hospitalized for one week for covid 8 uh, days prior and history of no other systemic illness so this is the uh, fundus picture of right eye which uh, appears absolutely normal coming to the left eye we see the blanching the pale retina and the cherry red spot here which is a classic of central retinal artery occlusion 
so how to uh, proceed this case uh, his all other uh, parameters uh, were normal blood pressure was normal sugar level were fine ecg 2d co was done it was normal uh, raise c reactive protein d dimer le- uh, levels were raised ferritin was raised so uh, this was uh, a covid patient which presented with an artery occlusion so uh, we uh, Uh, we thought of sending this patient to physician for the anticoagulation therapy and we tried decompression of the uh, chamber uh, doing an ac paracentesis but uh, these are mostly the irreversible cases so the retina remain uh, non perfused and the second case is of a 76 year old man came with a history of diminution of vision in the right eye since one week uh, diabetes since 5 years hypertensive since 15 years uh, rt pcr positive one week prior but not hospitalized so his vision in the right eye was 3 by 36 left eye was 6 9 absolutely fine so in this picture of the fundus we see uh, numerous uh, flame shaped hemorrhages all around the retina and uh, cotton wool spots in the macular area uh, suggestive of ischemia we did a oct imaging of this picture uh, patient and uh, we see hyper reflectivity uh, suggestive of ischemia and the massive macular edema so although the d dimer level were uh, not raised in this patient but hypertension was a risk factor which compounded with covid so this is a classic of central retinal vein occlusion so uh, we managed this case uh, by uh, again with the help of a physician for the anticoagulation therapy and uh, with the systemic steroids and intravitreal steroids and uh, uh, with a good result we uh, the outcome was good so next case is of uh, is of a 40 years old female uh, history of diminution of vision since 15 days in right eye history of fever one month back and rt pcr was not done no other systemic illness her vision in the right eye was finger counting near face and left eye was 69 so this is the most common uh, uh, feature which we have seen in the covid patient is the retinitis so we rule out all other causes of retinitis all other viral uh, immunological causes um, and uh, rickett shield causes so we found because the era was of covid we uh, did a covid igg and it came positive so we have seen many pe- uh, patients with covid retinitis and we managed uh, by giving uh, tablet doxycycline and tablet visulon uh, and uh, the oct picture shows the uh, macular edema or you can see a neurosensory detachment in these cases uh, intravitreal injections uh, uh, anti vegf injections will also work and have worked good in this patients so next case is a case of this is a very rare case of a, a 47 year old man with a nil systemic disease a sudden diminution of vision since two days uh, the systemic workup was absolutely normal rt pcr was negative but uh, covid igg was raised so this uh, here we can see a massive bleed this is a subhyoid bleed and here some altered bleed we can see this is a, a subretinal bleed so we managed uh, this case by uh, making a hole we can say a yag hyalurotomy and uh, uh, still there was a persisting subretinal bleed so we did a vitrectomy in this patient and uh, post vitrectomy the patient was doing fine but still fibrotic changes remain uh this is a case uh, next case of a 43 year old man with sudden painless diminution of vision since 11 days 8 days of admission for covid discharge one week ago so his uh, all the uh, d dimer was raised ferritin was raised and uh, left eye vision was 660 right eye was 69 so on examination we found that the right eye was absolutely fine but uh, the left eye show a different uh, kind of presentation so this is an altered subretinal bleed 
so how to manage and how to go so uh, we uh, did a oct scanning and here uh, we can see the altered bleed uh, that is the hyper reflectivity showing the subretinal bleed so we did a vitrectomy uh, and uh, subretinal tissue plasmin activator was uh, given and uh, it responded well so what we uh, what we have to learn from this that be aware of any spontaneous retinal bleeds it can be subretinal sub hyaloid sub ilm or vitreous due to covid so this is a last case a very interesting case of a 78 year old man came with a diminution of vision since 5 am in the morning so his right eye vision was counting finger near face and left eye was 2 by 36 so rapd in right eye was positive and his blood pressure was 200 by 120 so first of all we thought that it may be a hypertensive uh, retinopathy but the fundus looks absolutely fine no other hypertensive changes so mri was done and mri showed uh, some optic nerve abnormal signals which were suggestive of inflammation so we took a history of this patient uh, and he gave a history of uh, uh, received second dose of uh, vaccination 6 days prior so this is an interesting case of post vaccination papillitis um and uh, we uh, uh, treated him with and uh, iv prednisolone for 3 days and oral steroids uh, tapering and he responded well with uh, vision of 612 and 69 so what is the importance of retinal manifestations in the severe covid uh, the patients uh, who require hospitalization icu admission or vasoactive support uh, they present mostly in the second week with a sudden onset of severe vision loss cotoma or blurring so uh, they are more prone for the major artery occlusion or vein occlusion or small Uh, and capillary uh, occlusions also and uh, with the mild moderate severe also but uh, many times asymptomatic which present in th- third to six week uh, can present with blurring of vision floaters cotoma pain redness so they are more likely to be a vasculitic and retinitis changes and uh, sequelae of neuro vascularization sub hyaloid hemorrhage vitreous hemorrhage and endogenous ophthalm uh, uh, end of also so coming what uh, what sequel is uh, can we have uh, post covid this are not very common but this can be there there can be a permanent diminution of vision retinal and this pallor macular thinning due to the resolved retinitis thin necrotic retina altered macular hemorrhage uh, unreleased fibrotic tractions on disc and macula Uh, so what is our protocol for history taking uh, uh, all the symptoms severity as uh, we have all discussed uh, the covid with uh, with comorbidities history of thrombotic complications rt pcr uh, test or home recovered and uh, uh, never tested or symptomatic or vaccinated so these are the uh, all things uh, which uh, we need to ask the patient and covid antibodies have really helped us diagnose uh, these cases so what is the take home message for management is uh, uh, in a severe hospitalized cases uh, doing all the investigations uh, as we have all discussed so they lead to major and minor vascular occlusions and can cause a possible irreversible vision loss so they need an emergent treatment and mild or symptomatic patients come with the complications of delayed immune response and uh, they have better prog- prognosis but uh, they uh, are they can be treated with systemic steroids and ocular treatment of intravitreal injections uh, sometimes laser and uh, very less likely surgery so recommendations for retinal sc- screening these are not authentic reti- recommendations but these recommendations are from the experience and the number of cases we have seen uh, uh, from november 2020 to february 21 so we have seen almost 30 patients with 46 eyes 
so from these we have concluded that severe covid uh, uh, this crucial time is second week so screen the fundus for vascular occlusions and non uh, severe with comorbidities should screen the fundus at two weeks and monthly for the uh, immune mediated retinal responses uh so thank you so much uh for uh, giving me this opportunity and uh, i just want to say that it might be stormy now but the rain doesn't last forever so we hope for the best tomorrow uh, i would like to thank my mentors dr apurva ayachit uh, dr guru prasad dr shrinivas and uh, i am sangli for this opportunity thank you so much thanks dr priya it was a very nice presentation see today's uh, topic is a uh, fortification of tea with vitamin b12 and folic acid uh basically for prevention of neural tube defects like spina bifida and hydrocephalus and in addition correction of anemia in women of course it also helps the uh, older population by preventing uh, clotting in blood vessels of brain and heart so uh, the culprit is really folic acid deficiency let us see the history of this uh, fortification of food and this goes back to uh, 97 1997 when there was a large trial in europe on finding out the etiology of neural tube defect and uh, they found out that it was the folic acid deficiency uh, in women at the time of conception so uh, the result was in european and american countries they st uh, started to do fortification of food and the food product which they found was suitable for those countries was wheat flour as you know uh, most of these people eat bread so naturally they consume wheat and the wheat flour if required for any other food products is bought from the um, stores so it was easy for them to fortify food fortify wheat flour with folic acid and that was their main aim of controlling the incidence of neural tube defects and i must mention that mr godfrey oakley is the father of this conception and also he uh, convinced the united states senate and the government to make this compulsory to fortify wheat flour with folic acid now he, he these people I mean, this was introduced in 2004 since then at our international conferences on spina bifida of uh, hydrocephalus these stalwarts in western countries have been always asking us why don't you do this in your country when you have such a large incidence of um, neural tube defects uh, i must mention at this juncture that presently the incidence of neural tube defect which ranges from anencephaly to minor meningocele is over a lack of babies are born with this uh, birth defect every year in india and there is similar incidence which is 1% of live births so every one child in 100 births is born with neural tube defect at least in india same thing in other asian countries and african countries so at uh, last conference in delhi uh, on this topic was in 18 sorry 2018 so there i met uh, dr who is a professor of chancellor at indiana university ashok antony nri but he has been there a researcher in vitamin and related subjects for last 30 years so we both thought we must come out with some answer to this problem uh, we have tried this in 
uh, few states of india uh, fortification of wheat flour but that has not really worked uh, in reducing the incidence uh, and it is not uh, logistic to do it in india because <clears throat> we eat not only wheat we eat five types of grains we eat wheat jowar bajri nachni and rice which ones will you uh, fortify and for say uh, women of reproductive age who are likely to get conceived would be in number of nearly about 10 crores in our country and for that to fortify wheat flour for 130 crore people is not just possible and not also financially uh, profitable so uh, we came up with uh, idea of fortifying cup of tea tea is the next commonest uh, drink next to water which is consumed and tea is popularly taken by most of the adults uh, in india in all states and it is bought from the market so uh, it's not like wheat flour which you buy a wheat Uh, wheat grains for about a week or one month or six months, and get it uh, uh, floored in nearby pitachi chakki and eat. So, uh, but that is not the case with uh, tea. I would give an example of uh, fortification of salt with iodine. See, when it was found that it can be easily done. Uh, without raising much cost and it is uh, uh, accepted by all the uh, states uh, states and people of different financial uh, capacities so the tea was chosen and we uh, tested at indiana university whether uh, vitamin b12 and vitamin uh, uh, folic acid would be suitable for uh, Uh, adding to tea so uh, we check that it is water soluble these two vitamins are water soluble uh, they stand um, boiling uh, temperature of water then there is a good shelf life then uh, it doesn't change the odor or taste or color of tea and it is popularly consumed by uh, most of the uh, countrymen you will say that what about in uh, no, uh, southern states where coffee is more popular than tea but later on we will do that also uh, fortification of coffee but we have to first establish that this is a better actionable uh, vehicle so we thought of doing a preliminary study see as you know in all scientific studies you have to do randomized control trials but before uh, beginning such trials we have to know that tea is uh, a good vehicle it will deliver uh, whatever uh, added uh, vitamins uh, in one cup of tea that is equivalent to 2 grams of either uh, tea powder mamra or tea bag so we chose initially uh, two groups of women of reproductive age uh, these were uh, from nursing and homeopathy college uh, attached to uh, ghatgi hospital so uh, to one group we gave uh, 45 tea bags and another group also gave were given 45 tea bags but with different doses in both of these groups uh, folic acid was used 1 mg but uh, vitamin b12 was used uh, in one group 0.1 mg that is 100 micrograms and in another group 0.5 that is 500 micrograms and we uh, gave them cup of tea every day under supervision done at a, a, a canteen of the uh, college so that there were no mistake in making tea or boiling it too much other things and uh, 
at the end of two uh, months, we found that as compared to pre-experimental uh, levels of B12 and folic acid, there was a very significant rise in both these vitamin levels in the blood, as well as hemoglobin also showed a good response. That means uh, uh, we came to conclusion that tea can be used as a vehicle for delivering vitamin B12 and folic acid uh, to women of reproductive age. So if they consume this tea, fortified tea, uh, in their adolescent age, before marriage or uh, continue to use it after marriage, but before pregnancy, then their levels of these two vitamins will be sufficient to prevent neural tube defect in the fetus. And now you would say, uh, uh, we have been giving, we have been giving this uh, in the form of tablets after woman is pregnant. That is our national program. But remember, uh, this defect in the neural tube occurs before the woman knows that she is pregnant. That means it occurs within three weeks after conception. So uh, no amount of folic acid or B12 which is given later on would help to prevent neural tube defect in the fetus. So the fetal size is only of a rice grain within these three weeks, three to four weeks. And there, if the folic acid is deficient in that woman, uh, the metabolism of uh, uh, formation of uh, uh, ectoderm, ectodermal cells, they divide very fast and they require folic acid uh, for their methylization. And if that is insufficient, then the neural tube will not close. It may not close in the, at the level of uh, upper end or lower end or anywhere in between. So the spectrum of uh, uh, anomalies you get is from anencephaly to a very small uh, meningocele well covered, which can be treated and you can cure the baby. But there are variations uh, between brain to spinal cord. And if the spinal cord gets involved, then you have uh, the neural deficit below that level. So, uh, even if these babies are treated after, uh, soon after birth or little after birth, they will uh, remain with some deficiency because of neural tube defect, which occurs during uh, intrauterine life and you cannot correct it. So, <clears throat> we have to correct their, these two vitamins before they get pregnant. And it requires minimum of three months. See, till now, after the experience of uh, foreign countries, we introduced in India, we were canvassing our groups and the Spina Bifida Foundation and those who were interested in this, mainly pediatric surgeons, because we see these cases more often than any other uh, medical fraternity. And we know the results are bad. They require uh, multiple operations. And even at the end of these two, uh, uh, at the end of these operations, we may not make them 100% cured. So they uh, suffer a lot uh, throughout their life. Uh, along with them, the parents also suffer. The family suffers. They uh, suffer financially as well as psychologically. And their siblings of these children also suffer because the family cannot support these siblings uh, very well because they have consume their financial resource on treating this uh, 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 child with birth defects. So, uh, in that trial, we showed that giving tea for two months, that this was our pilot study, uh, with either uh, 0.1 milligram of B12 or 0.5 milligram of B12, and both containing 1 milligram of folic acid, was enough but not enough to correct everybody's uh, folic acid B12 deficiency and not correcting to a higher level, which would be maintained with their normal diet. So our next project would be 
to do randomized control trials on similar uh, type of women means eligible women of reproductive age and in that we will use 1 mg each of b12 and folic acid and give them this uh, tea for 3 uh, months followed by a maintenance dose for 8 uh, months but with very low dose that is 0.1 mg of folic acid uh, b12 and 0.5 mg of folic acid because that is sufficient to maintain their raised vitamin levels now you would ask uh, uh, what about the women and uh, all of us who take um, uh, tea which pre- prepared with tea powder see for benefit of correctness and deciding upon the dose we used tea bags because it was easy to inoculate these bags with micropipette uh, to uh, introduce 0.1 or 0.5 mg of b12 and 1 mg of folic acid and we used uh, uh, united states certified vitamins brought from uh, indiana university Uh, even the distilled water was a, a highly purified distilled water uh, with which we uh, uh, diluted these vitamins uh, here i must mention uh, because some of you would ask when the uh, initial studies were uh, shown uh, that folic acid is responsible why are we adding b12 because in last 5 years different studies one of them was from pune they showed pune and amdabad they showed that b12 deficiency is also one of the causes of folic acid deficiency hence we decided uh, to see uh, what are the levels in these reproductive age group uh, and we found in nearly 100 girls uh, attending different colleges uh, between 20 and 22 age group Uh, we saw their b12 and folic acid levels and 80% of them they were deficient in these two vitamins some of them were deficient in folic acid uh, 60% of these girls and uh, 20, 80% of the girls were deficient in um, uh, b12 now what is the cause of this deficiency in indian women because most of the women lack these two vitamins in their diet they are poorly supplying this uh, these vitamins e- even though some of the girls or some of the uh, uh, women are non vegetarian they also do not get sufficient b12 from their diet because they t- don't take it every day they take it once a week or so and that too whatever remains after men folks have taken their share so uh, we found that even the non vegetarian family members were also deficient in this so, uh, so this is this will co- continue uh, and these results were submitted in the paper form with 74 references now uh, british medical journal for nutrition uh, prevention and health they found out that this is the first type first experiment with uh, fortification of tea to provide these two vitamins in the world so they found that this is a really excellent paper although it was a preliminary study they decided to publish it as original research not only that their press office uh, told us uh, that we are going to uh, publicize it through their 5000 news outlets in the world because this has got implications and uh, 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 positive results uh, people would get all over the world now you will say what uh, westerners would get they would get uh, their this uh, correction of these two vitamins will also reduce certain neurological diseases and uh, thrombotic diseases in old people in addition to neural tube defects at birth there are some defects uh, which cause um, retarded mental growth 
uh, certain uh, neurological disorders in children, uh, which are not been shown to be due to certain uh, vitamin deficiency. But there is a uh, uh, indirect uh, inference that these two vitamins are also responsible for these uh, neural tube defects. Secondly, we have also found out that as the neural tube is a central uh, midline structure, similarly in front there is a cleft palate lip, a hole in the heart and gastroschisis that is the uh, deficiency of the anterior abdominal wall. These are also a result of folic acid deficiency. So, uh, in trying to do this, we are correcting the anemia, which is a very widespread uh, uh, condition in women uh, as well as in children. And that can be corrected with this uh, consumption of tea uh, every day uh, over a period of minimum three to six months. But they can continue to taking this tea. Uh, we have found out that this can be done at a blending place. Tea is produced in four states of India. That's all. And uh, after that thing, it is blended and sent to different uh, smaller companies elsewhere. And they pack it with their trade names with some additions like uh, ginger tea or uh, uh, lemon tea. Why not vitaminized tea? So it will be easier for them. So our next uh, job is to convince the FSS AI, that is Food Fortification uh, Association of India, which is the uh, apex body, that this fortification of these vitamins is essential. That is one. Secondly, we have to convince the health ministry that this should be made compulsory for all the uh, tea companies to come out with a brand. They may not do it in uh, all brands, but they can come out with one brand like Pulsi or ginger tea. They can come out with vitaminized uh, tea. Even further to that, we can have two types of uh, teas. One will be uh, full fortification for correcting the deficiency and another tea uh, for maintenance so that the production uh, cost will be less. And we are even advocating that to, we are advocating that to reduce the price, uh, uh, government can tell them to use their CSR funds to bring down the prices of uh, vitaminized tea. I think I have told most of the things, my time is also over, but uh, I would like to answer any questions you have in your mind. And we'll go further from that. Before that, I will go Hello. to more Hello. tracks which we are taking, undertaking. Hello. Ha, yeah. Okay. Shall I just conclude? The yes, next, sir. next trial will be with uh, uh, tea, tea, tea bags for the one group and uh, uh, tea powder for another group. Because we have to prove that... Uh, addition of these two vitamins uh, to tea powder is also equally effective. And then we'll go to the village women in Tazgao Taluka. Uh, and there we will uh, also try this for three months. And we are going to do survey of um, 15,000 families to find out the prevalence of neural tube defects over a past year, one year, uh, so that we will know what is the incidence in our uh, state? Similar trials will be done in other states also. And we have kept this open to all that they should do this on the lines we have done. Thank you very much.